So good evening, everyone. Did you all have a nice Thanksgiving? Yes. yes. Good. Cold? No? Huh? Was it cold? Were you guys cold? No. I was. <laughs> <laughs> my um, my son said to me, did you have any turkey? And I said, no. And he goes, why not? You're supposed to eat turkey. It's turkey day. I'm like, honey, I'm a vegetarian. We don't eat turkey. Well, it's turkey day. You're supposed to. He's like arguing with me to try to get me to eat turkey. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so a couple of things I want to address, first of all, um, while we wait for some other stragglers. Uh, this last two weekends, I actually was up in the cabins, and I met Doyle's brother, which was very funny. <laughs> um, we were up in the cabins, a friend of mine has a cabin, and we have been up there working on Omega 8. So it was really nice to be um, disconnected. They don't have internet or cable or cell phone service, so imagine my joy. <laughs> actually, I liked it. It was really nice not to be... Um, constantly having the phone and whatnot going off. Saw a lot of videos from George, caught up on a lot of that material. Um, and Omega-8s progress quite well, I would say. I don't have it solidified yet, but I'm fairly certain we're gonna get it off next year. The Omega-1 that was supposed to be this week has been canceled because we didn't have enough people. We usually run the holidays, we know this usually happens, so we're not too surprised about that. I almost expected it. So the next Omega-1 is January 9th to the 12th. Uh, the December impact training on the 14th. So you know we're gonna do it on meditation. It's the third part of meditation. And the thing that I'm actually excited about is in a lot of the research that I was doing this last two weekends, I found some of George's material on meditation that I have not been using. So I thought I'd like to summarize it up so I've got some good information for that. And then the Monday night workshop on December 16th, I um, was going to do it on the same theory, uh, on the same topic as tonight, but I changed it to the indigo children. Has anybody heard that term, indigo children? Okay, it's not a popular term, but it's been around actually since 1978, I think I researched that, where the concept is that the generation of kids that are coming in are a little bit more aware, uh, more kinder, <laughs> more um, compassionate, and conscious, as well as intelligent. I saw this, yeah, Mike? Have you ever met an indigo child? My son will tell you he's an indigo child, but he's not. No, I've never. You'd know if you met one. I don't know. I don't think I've ever met one. I've met one. Oh. And I have to tell you, it humbled me to a point where when I, when I sat for the first time with George, I had the same feeling when I met <clears> his <throat> child. Really? Because this wasn't a child. How old is he? Eight. Wow. They have giant black or dark eyes. Right. Really dark giant eyes. And they don't blink much, like George. Uh-huh. And very, very aware is just, aware doesn't do them justice. I mean, they're, they're on another level. What did he talk to you about? Um... We, we, I was kind of in awe, so I just, I just, I was treating him like a child, but he wasn't a child. I mean, I could, I could have had an adult conversation with him. His parents, I have to tell you, were also very, very serene, down-to-earth, balanced, respectful. They were also on another level. So these children, they're planned, I believe. They really are. Where did you meet him? Up in Sedona. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago? I'm going to say when I first got out here, so 2003. Because George had met a couple of kids up in Sedona, too, that he described mm -hmm. the same way that you're describing mm -hmm. them, and they were in Sedona, too. And I, I was truly blown away. Yeah. I really was. It's intriguing. Some of the research I've been doing, you just rack your brain like, mm -hmm. where did that come from? So one of the videos I saw was um, on Ellen. Ellen, you know. Um, the generous? Yeah. Uh, I don't watch much TV, but the one that has the talk show, she's been doing segments on kids, exceptional kids, mm -hmm. and this one kid, eight years old, who created, um, after the Hurricane Sandy, he created sandbags that are easier to handle, and they're not full of sand. They're full of salt, and Mark, do you remember the two different things he had in there? It was salt and two chemicals that it reacted to water, so it filled itself up when it got wet, and then the water just seeped out of it, and it was only like five pounds to pick it up. 
where the regular sandbags are like 50, 45, 50 pounds to maneuver, and they're not as durable. And this one, it's just this. And he created it because he felt bad for all the people in the Sandy, from the Sandy uh, hurricane. He lives in Florida. It had nothing to do with him. So it's they're global conscious kids. It's really um, quite amazing. So anyway, I've been having fun researching that. Um, let me stick to the schedule. So New Year's uh, on New Year's Eve. Wait, did they do everything in January? Yes. So that's the impact training, and then the next Monday night workshop. New Year's Day, for those of you who remember, last year we switched it from New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. We had a um, bring your own, what is it called? Potluck. Potluck, thank you. <laughs> we had a potluck. Uh, that was, I think we did it from 11 to 1. Is that, who was here last year? Were you here, Michael? Mm -hmm. And I know you weren't here. Was it 10? Was it 10? 10 to oh, a, no, 10 or 11. Yeah, so I think it was, and it, we had about 50 people, didn't we? It was a 45, 50? in and out, they meandered about. So um, that was nice. So anyway, we're not doing New Year's Eve anymore because I feel trepidatious about people driving on New Year's Eve. So it just is not, not my desire to be out that late at night. And then the next um, Omega-2 is January 23rd to the 26th. Um, and I think there's some room left in that one. So I think I did everything that you wrote on here. And the impact training on January is the 18th. January 18th, and I don't have a topic for that yet. Omega-4 is February 21st to March 2nd. So the schedule should be up on the, um, it should be up on the website. And of course, we're still in our quest to look for a new building. Um, that's still uh, not my number one priority right now. Obviously, I'm working on Omega-8, but it's still our quest that we're still looking for a new building. I am told that uh, the woman who owns this building, the bank may be calling in on the lease, so I might put a little newsletter thingy out to have people come and kind of pack up what we don't need just to get ready to get out in case we have to. Um, but I haven't heard any more about that. Okay, so who was here the last time we did the Secrets of the Polymath? Who was here the, for last Monday Night Workshop? Good. What do you remember about the polymaths? Tanya. <laughs> they have they are experts in many different areas and you restricted your list to those with with five big ones and or right. at least five. I went through the list of hundreds of people and I knocked it down to just people who were at least a minimum of five subjects. Okay. What else? On the lighter side, I asked my son if you want to come with us tonight. He's fifteen. Uh huh. He said, No, Dad, that's probably a adult program. I said, yeah, he can look over my head sometimes. I've got a sneaker out of him. Well, you tell him that I'm doing the program and that he's here, I won't pick on him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anything else? Does anybody remember anything else about the polymaths? Yes, Tom. Well, you were looking for a common theme, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think you divulged one. I did not divulge one. I found something entirely different than what I was looking for. So then I also asked you all, all to check and see within yourselves to see the different areas that you may have been an expert in. Do you remember that? So how many people came up with at least three things that they think they've done, three separate things that they've done? Two. An ex that being an not an expert. expert. Forget being an expert. Just different things. Let's say held different jobs. So Tanya, what did you come up with? Well, it, it's, it's Tamara. Tamara, Tamara, thank That's you. That's okay. <laughs> Gosh, I've done this. What was the other name I used to call you? Oh, Teresa. Teresa, Teresa. there you go. Yeah. Just Tamara, Teresa. Tamara. I'm just going to call you T. Triple <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> T. What were the ones you had? Well, this year I um, became certified as a permaculture designer. And I'm also in the middle of a certification in neuro-linguistic programming. Um, I worked for American Express for 25 years, and I made a point of learning as much as in as many different areas of the company as I could. So I did everything from legal attachments to, to fraud investigations to credit to you name it, I probably did it. Um, so you were a polymath in American Express. Yes, on, on purpose. Okay. Kurt says I missed my calling as a private investigator. I 
industrial mechanic, uh, musician, uh, writer of some sorts, um, teacher, basketball coach, um, all kinds of things. I mean, I just dabbled in a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't call me an expert, but I like the idea of, of doing different things. And I've done that my whole life, even when I was young. Um, it's just exciting. Okay. Excellent. So I wanted to kind of jog your memory just a little bit to see if you remembered some of the things that we talked about last week. What I want you to do right now, have a conversation with somebody. Of the things <coughs> that you have experienced or done, which was your favorite and why? So which was your favorite and why? So talk to whoever's around you about the things that you've done, which was your favorite and why. Go ahead. May I have your attention, please? This afternoon, my husband and I were driving back from, as I said, we were out of the cabin over the weekend. We were driving back this afternoon, and we were talking about the idea of how some people make a big to-do of not working on holidays. <laughs> And how my entire career of whatever job I've always been in, I've worked holidays. It's never been a big deal to me. I actually preferred working holidays because the pay was more. <laughs> and it was a lot more relaxed. One of the first jobs that I had when I came out here was I worked at Channel 3 as an engineer. I was there for about seven years. And the thing that was nice about that is TV's on 24-7, so... You usually work holidays, it's, and usually the low man on the totem pole works the holidays. So when I first got there, I worked every holiday. And then after a couple of years, you know, I'd have the option of not working. I'd always volunteer. And most of the time, I would volunteer for a double shift. So I'd work the first shift and then the second shift. Now, the thing that's nice about that is when you work eight hours and then an immediate second eight hours, the second shift is time and a half. And then when it's holiday, both shifts are double. So you made a lot of money just for working on Thanksgiving, let's say. Well, when I um, left Channel 3, then I had two other jobs, and we were both talking about both of us, no matter where we were, we always worked the holidays. It's just been a part of something we've done. When I first came to Omega, we used to do trainings on holidays. One of my very first trainings that I staffed was a Christmas, and I was surprised there was like 75 people in the room on Christmas Day but they wanted to be there and so did we. Like it never seemed to be an issue for me. So one of the things that boiled down for me is a characteristic that I think is that I love what I'm doing and I don't, ma I don't mind the sacrifice or the price. If I really love what I'm doing, I don't even count it as a sacrifice. It's just something I enjoy. So that's what I thought about when I was asking you guys which career did you love the most and why. Most of it's because we feel committed to it and it's easy. It's something we really become ignited in and enjoy. We can see the um, contribution that we're making as well. That's quite rewarding. Another reason why we do things, because it's rewarding. So back to the idea of the polymaths. And I remember, as I said last time, there was a big, long list of people. And I knocked it down. I made a requirement of five. They had to do at least a minimum of five different areas. And most of the ones that we discussed, and if you read the paper, they did more than five, but at least five different. And then I also did them in chronological order. And um, what was the other thing that I did for them? Oh, and then I was looking for the common thread. So I mentioned last time out of the 47 names, I only recognized 10. And of those 10, I didn't really know what they did. I just knew I knew 10, like I knew um, Da Vinci. I knew Michelangelo, I knew Aristotle, and that, you know, just minimal, the rest of them. And I didn't really know everything that Aristotle and Da Vinci and um, the, those, the likes of those names knew. I just recognized names. So then I thought, okay, let's look for the commonalities. And, you know, being a philosopher, I'm thinking, oh yeah, they're all going to be philosophers. And then I was really disappointed when I discovered only 21 of them were philosophers. That's less than half of the polymaths. So I was thinking that, oh, we're gonna dance. <laughs> I was thinking that if less than half were the philosophers, does, does that mean that philosophy doesn't make a contribution to humanity? So, you know, anyway, I know I had an affixed attachment, but I wanted to find them all as philosophers. So what I started doing is, okay, well, if they're not philosophers, what were they? What were the commonalities? 
And as I started tallying this up, a structure started to show up. Um, let's see, what would George call it? A chart? Or my mind is gone. <laughs> Something showed up. A, what? a pattern, thank you. A pattern showed up. Now, I'm going to stop for a second. I want to just draw your attention to the electromagnetic spectrum. Please don't worry, I'm not going to test you on this one. But we introduced this to you in Omega-1. We talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum, the way science today, where they're actually condensing it down, but they say there's four universal laws. Gravity, the weak nuclear force, which things expand, the strong nuclear force, which things contract you, and then the electromagnetic spectrum, which has to do with vibrations. And then we have the different areas, there's seven of them up there, the different areas of vibrations, remember the larger the wave, and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller. In the center, or kind of in the center, it, there's this sign that says, visible light, you are here. We correlate <coughs> that to white light. And, you know, in white light, if you separate white light, it breaks up into seven colors. Seven colors, Ageless Wisdom Teachings talks about that, correlates to the seven different levels of us. So I have everyone, right? We're talking about visible light, and metaphorically, it correlates to the different levels of each one of us. Now, visible light, or the word light, in the Ageless Wisdom Teachings is often talked about, it could be God, or spirit, or the teachings, but light is used in many different philosophies and religions to represent something greater than ourselves. So. In 1990, the very first study group that George presented, he talked about how Torkum, another gentleman who talked about the ageless wisdom teachings, said that in every venue, everything that we do in life, it breaks out into seven different areas. He called it seven expressions of light. It's not the seven colors, it's seven different expressions of light that we operate as a society. We talk about this actually in Omega-4. It's politics, education, philosophy, art, science, religion, and economics. All seven of these are required for us as a society, society to function. So again, it's politics, education, philosophy, art, science, religion, and economics. Now, there are some of us that when we hear the word politics, we go, ah, I don't have anything to do with politics. Because we have the vision that politics is Washington, D.C. Not so. That's just an expression of politics. What I did is I came up with a, a short little definition of what the teachings call politics and education and so forth. So politics is the effort of leaders to bring humanity into synthesis, harmony. So typically, or traditionally, the idea of politics is to create harmony. Now, of course, we know we don't have that today, but it's the ultralistic point of view where I want to go. It's all about harmony. That's politics. Now, think about it in your own life. Is there ways that you operate to create harmony in some of the conflicts you have, some of the struggles that you may encounter, some of the decisions you have to make? Do you use politics? The next one is education. Now, education seems like an easy thing. Education, go to school. Well, education isn't just about going to school. It's actually the process of understanding. So you don't have to go to school to practice education. It's just a process of understanding. Understanding everything from understanding how to operate an iPhone every time they change the operating system. I now have to figure it out. That's education. So education can be on anything, any topic, any level. You actually can be educated with an indigo child. They, it doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be anybody that you're learning something from. That's education. The next one is philosophy. The desire to find the wisdom behind all things. So in other words, once I learn something, how do I apply this? What's the wisdom of this idea? So I'm looking for a philosophical understanding. So it's one level above the understanding. It's the wisdom, the application of what I've learned. The, third, the fourth one is art. Art is the desire to manifest in form, in sound, in color, the harmony and beauty of life. So through the list of the polygraphs, polygraphs, 
<laughs> doing a list of probably maps. <laughs> Many of them had different versions of art, whether it was poetry, uh, music. Some of them were artists, actual artists, sculptors, obviously Da Vinci and Michelangelo. So art showed up in many different forms. Even writing would be considered an art. So it's the expression of beauty in life. Science, this is the desire to search for the laws and the principles behind all things. Now for those of you who remember George, he was a bit of a scientist. He loved to figure out the ins and outs of why things work. Most of the stuff he talked to me about when it was scientific went right over my head. You can probably still see the track. It just was over my head. So this weekend, it was curious because we were, when we went to the cabin, we packed the truck with books. I mean, we had like one suitcase and everything else was books because of stuff that I wanted to research. So George, I mean, sorry, Mark picked up this book that George had um, talked about. It's a very scientific book. So when he showed me the book, I went, uh-oh. <laughs> I hope he doesn't want me to have a conversation about that. <laughs> but I'm smiling, going, oh yeah, you, you can read that one. <laughs> so that's another thing that's funny. He's got a scientific flair, I do not. I'm more of the artist. So we have the difference there. But anyway, still valid, still necessary, one of the principles. It doesn't have to just be about science. It's the search for the laws and principles behind all things. So if you're attuned to it, um, for example, being a massage therapist, I was a massage therapist for over 25 years. I had to learn anatomy. I had to learn physiology. I could give a care what constitutes a cell and the nucleus and the membranes. It just doesn't, how has that got to do with massage? I just want to learn muscles and bones. But we had to learn everything because muscles and bones are created by cells, blah, blah, blah. I honestly do not know how I passed that part of the <laughs> program. Then there's religion. This is the desire to relate to God. That's easy. You can call it God, spirit, the higher self, whatever form you want to use. It's something greater, higher than ourselves. Most people are aware there's something greater than us. Obviously, we didn't create the planet. Something else did. So we're aware of that, and religion is our attempt to connect with that, to relate to it, to understand it. And finally, we have economy. Now, economy is one of the hardest ones I thought of, because economy, most of us think of money, the economy. We call it the economy. But it could also be um, energy. It doesn't have to just be money. It manifests as money. But economy is actually the desire to share and to organize the right distribution of resources to make sure that everyone has their share according to their contribution. Like you don't overbalance one and give to somebody who hasn't been contrib contributing. It's a balance. So I looked at these seven levels and I thought, okay, how can we apply this in a personal life? In my personal life, how can that be applied? Well, in politics, the effort of bringing harmony. So. Do I try to have harmony in our family when the kids are going at each other? You bet. <laughs> it takes politics sometimes to manage teenagers. Then we have education, the process of understanding. So what are the things that I'm learning to understand? Well, I'm learning to understand the mechanics of real estate, because I don't really know too much about that, looking for a new building. I'm learning to understand some of George's teachings so I can further deliver them. Um, philosophy the desire and wisdom to, um, behind all things, to find the wisdom. Of course, that is something I do almost on a daily basis. Art, manifested form, sound, color, the harmony and beauty of life. Now, I don't think I do too much art work, <clears throat> but I know I encourage the kids. Writing, I write a newsletter every week, so that's a form of art. Um, science, we're going to skip that. Religion, <laughs> I have no desire for science. <laughs> Religion, of course, I said relating to God, that's what meditation is for. And then economy, the desire to organize, distribute all of our resources. So what I decided to do is, as I was looking at the pattern of the polymaths, because remember, we're talking about the polymaths now. Of the 47, here's what I discovered. 16 of them were involved in the area of politics, whether it's the science of politics or actual politicians. 32 of them were involved in education, and of this, 20 of them were actual mathematicians. 21 of them were philosophers. 
33 were involved in at least one area of art. 36 of them were involved in the area of science. This is the largest group, science. Thank you very much. And the science went from anything from astrology, astronomy, botany, zoology, chemistry, physics, all of those. You know, Sheldon would be so happy <laughs> from the Big Bang Theory. All right, watch the show, it's funny. <laughs> Five of them were involved in some area of religion, and 18 were involved in economy. So I thought, wow, there's the thread I was looking for. This is what they have in common, the expressions of life, the seven different areas that all of us experienced on a day-in and day-out basis. Many of the, the polymaths excelled in multiple areas of science. So even if, it just, even if I counted it just as science, many of them had at least five different areas of science that they were involved in. And they were involved in many different areas of education as well, art and philosophy. So, I thought, okay, let me look at this list and find how many of them actually did all seven. How many do you think it was? Just to some degree? I mean, all seven. All of them, one had all seven areas in their expertise. All expertise. Expertise okay. in all seven areas. <clears throat> None very, of them. Very little. None. One. It was just one. Aristotle. Now remember, Aristotle is considered to be one of the greatest human beings who walked the planet and the greatest polymath. So he was the only one who had all seven areas of expressions of light. Now, he had over 20 areas he was an expertise in, but he managed to hit all seven. Not all of them were in all seven of them. What I thought about with Aristotle, which is so incredible, Many of his writings and teachings, up until the 19th century, were considered foundation. And even today, in colleges, there's certain um, botany and zoology, there are certain things he created that are still the way to do it. He created that. The logic system, he created that as well. So here's a gentleman who, oh, I don't have when he lived. He lived some time ago, and yet today, it's still considered the foundation of our education. That to me is amazing. So he's the only one who had all seven, which didn't surprise me. I was, I was um, pleased about that. And then I decided, okay, well I said a minimum of five, so let's check this out. How many of them had six? Out of the six, there were one, two, three, four, five. Five people had at least six, and then one, two, three, four, five. Five people had at least five. So in the seven, six, or five, out of all of them, it's a total of 11 polymaths did at least five of the expressions of light. That's what I was considering to be my connection to all of them. Now, as I said last Monday, what we were looking for was the idea of their contribution, what they've done to the planet, for the planet, and for humanity. So with the seven expressions of light, all of these have made a contribution in the seven areas. So again, it's politics, education, philosophy, art, science, religion, and economy. Now, I'm gonna pause for a second here. What I want you to do is have a conversation with your buddy and talk about the idea of politics. What kind of role does politics play in your life? Are you a politician or a reformed person who is involved in politician? If politician is in it, what kind of politics are you involved in? and pretty much see if you can do it on a day-to-day -day life. And politics could be anything from driving on the streets, <laughs> navigating mm -hmm. through traffic, to being in the stores on Black Friday. <laughs> That's all about politics as well. So talk to your buddy about some of the areas of politics that you've encountered so far. Go ahead. May I have your attention? All right, let's hear from some of you. What are some of the things that you've experienced politics in? One at a time. <laughs> well, I just said that politics and salesmanship are pretty well entwined. That you, you'd be a lousy politician if you weren't a salesman. That's right. Probably be a lousy salesman if you weren't a good politician either. Yeah. All right. Excellent, Doyle. Thank you. Yes. It was brought up that there's a lot of politics when you're married. So politics and marriage. That's good. Anyone else on politics? Yes. I've 
think I'm not a dictator. You think you're a dictator? <laughs> <laughs> that was good, actually, because that is a form of politics. That's right, I didn't think about that. Yeah, All right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it's good, but not. Good awareness, there you go. <laughs> How do you feel about Hitler and the Mafia? knocking at our cabin door and said, oh, we're having a decorating the gate. You know, come on up and decorate. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> Mark's very social. Yeah, yeah, we'll go up there. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> Can I pick up the science book? <laughs> but in politics, I understood, OK, that's you know creating harmony. This is something Mark wants to do. It's not going to hurt me. Might as well meet the neighbors. That's not a big deal. So we went up there. It was really funny. Because we met Doyle's brother there. <laughs> He's the guy who came knocking on the door. And when we, we were driving back, or yeah, when we were driving back to the cabin, I looked at Mark, or who was it today? I don't remember we were talking about it. And I said, you know, his last name's Bigelow. I don't know too many Bigelows. I bet you he's related to Doyle, because he looked like Doyle. And Mark's like, yeah, I was thinking about the same thing. And so then, of course, we showed up tonight. Here he is. <laughs> we're like, hi. <laughs> so anyway, that was my example of politics, to create harmony. It really didn't cost me anything. I just went up there, watched everyone, and you know, get to meet some people. Not something I would do. Education, of course, the most recent education is the polymaths. I didn't pay attention. And, learning about the polymath. So that was um, my next one. So philosophy. Now remember, the idea of philosophy here is the desire to find the wisdom behind all things. So this might be a little bit more of a challenge. So talk to your buddy about some of the wisdom 
you've been searching for. Go ahead. All right, if I can have your attention. Mm -hmm. So yes. philosophy, a little bit harder, but what are some of the things that you may have discovered on philosophy? Yeah. Wisdom on certain things. Yeah, you're just bucket fulls of wisdom tonight, huh? <laughs> okay, so this one is a little bit harder, but uh, the thing I'm going to go with is something very recent. As we were driving here today, uh, Mark's son, he's 11, announces to everyone in the car he is going through puberty. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> he's 11. Now, knowing ages, no, he's not. So I could have argued with him. I could have said, Joseph, you're too young for puberty. What are you talking about? But he's boasting, I'm going through puberty. My, my voice, and I go, really, do you have any facial hair? No, do you have any armpit hair? No. Hmm, so you're going through puberty because, oh, my voice is cracking. Really? Well, do you have a fever? <laughs> So I could have challenged him and made him wrong, but the wisdom would be, I want to support him. So I said, well, how do you know? And he goes, I feel it. I just feel it. And I said, well, okay, if you feel it, then maybe you are going. Oh, lots of kids my ages are, are going through puberty. Okay, really? Who? Oh, I'm the first one. Oh, <laughs> good. That's good, honey. Do you, how do you feel about being the first one? So again, the wisdom, the philosophy here was not to make him wrong. He's wanting to be important and feel like something has happened to him. Okay, encourage him. Mm -hmm. And then he gets on the phone and I can hear him tell his friend, oh yeah, I can see my mustache. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, I need to put makeup on you on Friday for an Egyptian thing. What are you talking about, mustache? Did you borrow my makeup? <laughs> but it, again, not make him wrong. So the philosophy of love, compassion, understanding. I don't need to challenge him. He's having his own experience. That's fine. So. That, that would be my most recent thing of philosophy. Art, the desire to manifest in form, in sound, in color, the harmony and beauty of life. Have a conversation with your buddies about art, if that's part of your life. All right, if I can have your attention. <laughs> so when it comes to art, I don't consider myself very much of an artist. Um, I have an artistic flair, but I don't think I'm really much of an artist. My dad, uh, mechanical engineer, he constructed, designed and constructed bridges for uh, 30 years in New York City. That's a bit of art, that's construction and architecture. Um, my mother, very artistic, so the arts and crafts, things that we had to do for school, she always would get totally into them. Many years she used to sew our own clothes. I mean, she was very, very artistic. Didn't use patterns. She could just see, measure us, and then just create something. I think that's very, she, to this day, is still very artistic. My brother Christopher, many of you know him, artist, complete, total artist. He played the cello when he was young. He'd just hear a tune and play it. He'd play the piano. Same thing, just hear the tune, play it on the piano. He can draw, paint, color, just fantastic artist. And of course, he's an actor, so that's all part of it. The only thing he doesn't do, I don't think he sings. I'm not really sure. At least I haven't heard him sing. Have you heard him sing? I don't think I've heard mm -hmm. him sing. So um, then, for me, the idea of art, I, I'm not, didn't really skilled with paint. I mean, when I do paintings, it, I have to do the paint by numbers. <laughs> and even that, I still mess up. I have to do the wrong number thing. <laughs> but uh, photography, I love photography. That's something that comes natural to me. So that's an expression of art, but I heard somebody say uh, interior design or interior decorating, and I do that. I think I have a pretty good flair for laying things out in the house. Unfortunately, poor Mark, his whole house has been rearranged the way I think it should be. <laughs> it's got better flow <laughs> to it, yes. Do you think you would consider comedy or humor yeah. an art form? Yes, I would say comedy and humor is an art form. Thank you, so I am funny. Right. <laughs> so as a side note, most of you don't know, I do impressions, so one time we counted out the different voices, so it's not impressions, I could just change my voice to different things, 27 different ways that I could express my voice, it was very funny. I had um, George's wife Evelyn laughing on the floor because I would just like say things in a different voice and She'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, every once in a while, Gandhi would come out. 
Yeah, so stuff like that. I just change my voice. And to me, it's natural. I didn't know it would be hard for people to do that. Probably because we grew up talking like a New Yorker, and then when you had to get rid of talking like a New Yorker, you had to learn how to speak differently. And it's very funny when the kids hear me talk. The first time my grandchildren heard me talk like a New Yorker, I was playing around with somebody. And I, I don't know, Mackenzie, she's going to be 17 times. So she was about maybe four or five. It scared her. She turned to look to see who was in the car. Because, you know, my voice changed when I started talking like a New Yorker. It didn't, she did not expect it. And then we would sing Jingle Bells, and I would sing it like Louis Armstrong or something. And they'd be like, who is that voice coming from? It's very funny. So I would say that's probably my expression of art right there. Science, I totally want to skip. But I'm going to let you have a conversation about science and see if that's something that actually comes into your life, if it's something that you talk about or investigate. Yeah, I've already got blank looks on your faces, so this might be a very fast conversation. <laughs> so talk to your buddies about science. Yes, my definition of science again. Yes, the definition of science is the desire to search for the laws and principles behind all things. To search for the law and principle behind all things. Go ahead. May I have your attention, please? Does anybody want to share about science? Oh, yay! Please share. This got me all excited because for me, I've always been fascinated by science, but it's, it's in a philosophical sense. And we all started talking about how so many of these are tied together, the science, the art, the philosophy, yes. the religion. Uh -huh. the, um, and, and that's where science attracts me. It's, it's almost like more of a physical, philosophical aspect, but it, it ties so strongly together that that's, that's what gets me going. So Tamara, what you said, uh, did I say it right, Tamara? Yes. Thank you. So Tamara, <laughs> remember, <laughs> these are seven expressions of light. If the light is separated, it shows up in the seven areas. But together, united, it's one thing, an expression. So you're right. They're all tied together and can bounce off of each other. So that's excellent. So I would say my philosophical desire for science is there. But the actual ins and outs of chemicals and beakers and stuff, I could say beaker and I could sound like I'm a scientist, but the beaker's the glass thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's my understanding of um, science. I was thinking of George. How many people saw the movie October Sky? <gasps> oh, yes. people go see it. October Sky. Oh, yeah, with Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, Homer Hickam, The Rocket Boys. It was originated in West Virginia. George went to high school with them. They were two years behind him. They grew up in the same town as George. He knew the whole story. So as a matter of fact, that was one of the movies I would put on to calm him down, is we'd watch the October Sky. Because he would just go, oh, I know that teacher. He knew the teacher. He knew the principal. It was really refreshing for him. But I want to just go back to the idea that in that, it was four kids that were just playing around one day, and they wanted to invent rockets. And Homer Hickam, who was the main character, he's the one who wanted to do more than just coal mining. That's what George's dad was, a coal miner. He wanted to do more than just be a coal miner. So he was fascinated with science and astronomy and the fact that the first satellite, which was Russian satellite, me, Sputnik, Sputnik, thank you, Sputnik that went across, just captured his attention. So for that, that, to me, when I think about science, George ignited on that one. So when I think of science, there's so many different fields of science. Back in the old days, when Aristotle was prominent, numerology was considered a science. Astrology was considered a science. You planted your crops according to the stars. The Farmer's Almanac still, I think it still exists. That's all based on astrology as well. So. Those things, if I think about it, okay, well, numerology. I can get into numerology. I still do that. Astronomy, no, not so much, but I, I have this app on my phone. It's actually kind of funny. It's, um, it says star view, and what it does is it shows you the planets. Mm -hmm. So when you move your phone around, it'll show you where the planets are. And if you do that, you can see, like, down there the moon <coughs> might be. And so I'll take my phone out at night. And I'll take um, Joseph Marks on. We take him out, and he'll look around, and then you can switch it to where it's not planets, but you can see the constellations. So we'll go in his room, and I'll take a picture of Saturn above his bed, 
and you could keep the picture on there so it looks like Saturn's floating in his bed. It's kind of cute. But so stuff like that I could be into, but not a genius act. All right, religion. Remember religion? This is the desire to relate to God. Have a conversation with your buddy about religion if it's part of your day in and day life. Go ahead. May I have your attention, please? Yes. Religion is an interesting subject. There are some people, as soon as you say the word religion, ears turned off, they don't want to hear it, and then some people perk up. It's curious, um, through some of the readings that I was doing this weekend, uh, George talked about the different levels of consciousness that exist, and there's one level where people rebuke religion. They do not, don't have anything to do with it, deny it, so on and so forth. And then finally they come around, they do full circle, and realize that there's something is greater than um, themselves. I actually knew an atheist, Dick Hutton. Well, no, not Dick Hutton, it was Dick, what was his Dick name? Hutton. No, 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 the, uh, the artist. Dick Hutton. Dick Hutton? I was right. Dick Hutton, thank you. <laughs> he was the atheist, the first atheist I ever met. <coughs> Didn't know God, this is it, this is the only life we have, when we die, that's it. <coughs> I found it intriguing about him, though. He was one of the, how do I say this politely, he's passed away, I don't want to mar his memory. <coughs> Cheapest people I've ever met. <laughs> he never wanted to spend a penny, he was a big penny pincher, so he never spent, pen never spent anything. He lived in an old rickety house <coughs> in downtown Phoenix. <laughs> Did he have a bed or he slept on the floor, didn't he? Yes. The mattress on the floor. Yes. Yeah. Very little furniture. Yes. So very, very cheap man, from what I understand or remember about him. And an atheist. So unfortunately I connected the idea that all atheists are cheap. <laughs> Which I'm certain is not true, but because he was my first introduction to an atheist, that's what I sort of uh, made the connection to. But the idea of religion. So this weekend, I started um, reading uh, Psalm 119. George mentioned this a lot. It's, if you do any research about this, you'll discover it's in the center of the Bible. The very center of the Bible. And it's 119, and then the, all the, um, it's 22 chapters, which correlates to the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There's so many connections there. It's just supposed to be a very sacred text. Well, in the very first chapter, I was reading, actually, I think I read this last night. The very first chapter, it talks about how you have pride or not being ashamed that you believe in God. Essentially, that's what it boiled down to. And I thought that's kind of funny because I grew up as a Roman Catholic, not a Catholic, a Roman Catholic. Those are the, that's like the Orthodox Jew. It's the opposite side. We go to church every day and... I have no idea what we did there. I don't understand. I just knew I had to memorize the prayers, and when you did that, you know, you got the two thumbs up and got your confession. I, I mean, not confession, confirmation. I don't remember what the confirmation was for. I just know you had to do it. And then, uh, eventually, I drifted away because I didn't like the structure of organized religion. Plus, I did some research and found out that in 550 AD, the council, the church council changed a lot of Jesus' teachings and made it more appropriate. I didn't like that, so that kind of uh, made me drift away. And then, of course, once I met George and came into Omega, I started searching other religions. And one of the things I discovered is in almost every dogma, in every philosophy that's been out there, there's commonality throughout all of them. Love one another, <coughs> compassion, understanding, sacrifice. There, it's threaded through all the different religions, and I thought, you know, if that's threaded through all the different religions, there can't just be one that's right. All of them have a piece of truth to it. So then coming back to the idea, I remember the last Omega 4 I did, I had a participant come up to me at the end and said, you know, you talk about God a lot, and I'm really struggling, because I can't ground that this is about God, because this is not supposed to be a religious program. And I asked her, why do you think it's religious just because I use the word God? That doesn't make it religious, it's just a word. It's like saying dad or mom, it's just a title. She was really offended by the word God and adamantly requested that I change <laughs> much of the <laughs> lectures to not use the word God. <laughs> and I just suggested to her it might be an opportunity for her to embrace something 
and understand and accept, practice acceptance. So anyway, that's where religion comes from. And finally, we're down to economy. So again, the one-liner for economy is the desire to share, to organize, right distribution of resources. So have a conversation with your buddy about organization. I'm sorry, economy. May I have your attention, please? Now, naturally, economy is easy to connect with money. Most people think about economy and money, they're equivalent. When I first started traveling to Calgary back in the 90s uh, to do Omega trainings up there, one of the first things I discovered about Calgary was what a beautiful city it was. It's just north of Montana's border. Sorry. It's just south, <laughs> north of Montana's border. <laughs> but the city itself was very beautiful. On every city block, one corner of the city block had a park. And the park wasn't just like something the size of this room. It was a considerably large park, well maintained. Downtown Calgary had what they call plus 15, where the buildings in downtown were connected by a walkway across the streets between the buildings 15 feet high. So literally, if in the wintertime, if you were in downtown, you never had to step outside. You could travel throughout all of downtown inside. What I discovered is the parks and the walkway were built by the oil people. Calgary is a big oil town. It's um, out in the plains. Geologists are doing very well out there. But the oil industry is huge in the city of Calgary. Now, the oil people, the businesses, could have kept the money for themselves, but they didn't. They gave back to the city, because many of the people employed in Calgary work for the oil companies. So they took their money and put it back into the city, so that the people living there were comfortable and taken care of. So you have the city blocks, you have the plus 15s. The, um, there's two rivers that go through the city as well. It's called the Elbow and the Bow <coughs> River. They're maintained as well and all along the walk of the rivers. There's beautiful walkways. There's a running track around the whole city too. It really is a beautiful city. It's an excellent example of economy. There is no greed here. The oil businesses recognize that they were using these people to get um, product and profit so they wanted to reward them. They're the ones who built, as a matter of fact, it was the oil companies that built all of the Olympic um, stadiums and whatnot, because Calgary had the Olympics, I think, in 92 or something like that in the 80s. The oil companies are the ones that built all of those, and um, the big indoor one where the ice skating rink was, they turned it into a fitness center free for all Calgarians. It's a big, huge thing that you can go to, you don't have to pay. It's all indoors. So that's a good example of economy. I was also thinking about um, a few weeks ago, George, uh, Mark gave me this article. Uh, it's the New Yorker. Is it the magazine? It's called the New Yorker? Yeah. On the cover is a list of all entrepreneurs. And it says, governments are not solving the problems. Companies are not solving the world's problems. It's the entrepreneurs who are solving the problems. And it listed about 20 of them, and all 20 of them are people who are using their money to help society. Yes? It was Forbes magazine. Forbes, thank you. Forbes magazine. So the Forbes magazine had um, at least 20 different entrepreneurs and what they were doing with their money. Now, of course, Bill Gates, top of the list, he was there. Bono, um, am I saying that right? Bono. 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 The dude, YouTube. YouTube dude. <laughs> He hooked up with Bill Gates, and they've been working with the AIDS Foundation or, and preventing AIDS. But the one that really captured my attention, there was, uh, when you look at the picture, there was one girl, very young. She, she looks like she's in her 20s, really, really young. And she's considered one of the wealthiest people. Oh, well, wait a second, like, who is this woman? So I read up on her. Her name was Patricia, and I don't remember the second half of her. It's not Patricia Hurst. <laughs> it was Patricia something, or Patrice. And the story is she was of a Russian immigrant, and the Russian family had all the money. Her father and mother divorced when she was young, so the father took her stocks <coughs> and bonds and invested it into the company. 
And then I guess when she turned into her 30s, the cousins wanted to liquidate it all and they were going <coughs> to exclude her and her brother because they no longer were part of the family. So she sued. She sued her dad for her right and ended up, her and her brother ended up with well over $500 million each. So that, to me, if you got six cousins and they're all getting a half a million dollars each, there's a lot of money there. <laughs> so they broke up the family. But she said, the thing is, when she got this money, it wasn't that she wanted to just go out and do bling like a Paris Hilton. So that is the opposite. Unfortunately, you have all these kids now who are spoiled. They don't do anything for what they have, and they're spoiled, and it throws the economy off. What she did is she took her money, she said, I better make this money worth it because it's really not mine anyway, so to give it back. So she's been involved in um, New Guinea, I think it's New Guinea, she's in there. They're working on, okay, this is going to sound a little gross, but here's what they're doing. They're working on human fecal matter to turn it into plastic or fence post, like some, some substance that could be reused rather than... Um, the waste. And what she said is, because at this one city that she was at, there's this hill called Lavender Hill, which is really bad, because there's this huge yellow truck at least 150 times a day. All this truck does is goes, collects human waste, takes it over to the hill, and dumps it off into the ocean. And where they're dumping it off into the ocean, you could see it from space. And so if you Google it, you can see it from space. And the intriguing thing is, about 50 to 100 yards down the way are fishermen gathering fish that close to all this waste in the water. So she's like, no, 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 no. Something's got to be done about this. So that's one of the things that she's doing. So I think that's a good description of economy, the desire to share and organize the right distribution of resources. And the Forbes magazine actually did a good um, article where they showed all these people who had more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime, and instead of squandering it on themselves, they were using it to help humanity to go through crisis. And I, I was really moved by it. And I thought, you know, this is true. It's not politics. It's not the governments. It's not businesses that are going to do it. It's individuals, individuals that are rising up to the cause. I found that very, very inspiring. So that takes us through the seven levels. Politics, education, philosophy, art, science, religion, and economy. I wanted you to take a look at these because here's what I ended up doing. Remember I asked you to talk about the different areas that you came into that you really liked in your life and to see if we can kind of connect with the polymaths? Well, I ended up doing that with me. So I added the different things that I've done, and these are just the predominant ones. It's not everything that I've done. What I did was, I went through and just for fun, I wanted to see which one of my areas ended up in one of these expressions of light. So here's what I did. Um, the first thing was easy, philosopher. I'll just put that in philosophy, that's just what I do. Facilitator, public speaker. So facilitator on my one, that's philosophy, but also education. That would be considered education. Currently I'm an executive business coach, that's about economy working with the businesses, learning how to interact, treat each other like human beings instead of just a number. Massage therapist, for the 23 years that I was a massage therapist, that's science. I had to know anatomy and physiology there. I was at one time a graphic designer and a photographer. That's art. Someone last week brought up the fact that I'm a humanitarian. So that would be political. I would say that's part of politics. Humanitarian is politics. And then I told them that that's six. That's six of the seven expressions of light that I've actually been involved in. So I kind of wrote down, I said I had to sit down for a second. Because <laughs> I actually fell into six. I thought only the polymaths did that. But six of my careers have been in each one of those expressions. And then, um, as I was talking to Mark about this, he said, no, you have to add religion too. Because religion is the desire to relate to God. And that's what we do in Omega 4, mm -hmm. in Omega. And in Omega 8, which I'm working on right now, it's all <coughs> connected to connecting within. That, I think, is too much for me to handle. <laughs> that I actually go through all, se all seven of the expressions of light. But, as George talked about, 
each one of these seven expressions exists within all of our lives. You actually have an opportunity to talk about it, how you all have experiences and the expressions of life here. It was my desire to come up with a continuity, some thread that connects all the polymaths. I had no idea that it was going to be this. I really thought it was going to be something about compassion or understanding or the desire to learn. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with this. And the idea that I came up with is that if we look at this, there's no difference between me, you, and the polymaths. So there's a common thread that connects us all the way back to the very first polymath, which was 2368 uh, BC. That is amazing to me, that all of us carry these traits. Now, of course, the polymaths excelled in these areas. I don't excel in them. They excelled in each one of these. I don't but I've tasted it. So what I thought about was perhaps one day, I really think George will head up there, but maybe me, you, or someone else that we know will end up gracing the list of polymaths who excelled in more than one level of our lives. So that's all I had for the polymaths. I really enjoyed researching this and having fun. Um, I wrote a lot of this out here, so you'll all get a, a paper when you leave here today on the polymaths. I don't have the first <coughs> one available. Do we have that one? The first one available? If, uh, is it in the gift shop? Ah. <laughs> you didn't get the first one. <laughs> Email one and somebody will send it to the you. First, the first one from last Monday night gift yeah. shop? Yeah, we handed it out, didn't we? Yeah, is it in the gift shop? So I don't I have think this it is, yeah. Yes, okay, it so if you didn't yeah. get last week's or the last one, no, you can have it. Huh? Print was and that's all I have for tonight. I'm a little bit over 8.30, so thank you for letting me chat a little bit longer. And as I said, the next time we meet, that'll be on the 16th, 14th. Uh, sorry, the 16th. I'm going to talk about Indigo children, which I'm excited about, too. So thank you all for being here. Have a good guest, Lewis. If a person excels in, in this polymath type of thing, would he be kind of considered the egotistical and going beyond the average? Um, you know, Lewis, I think yeah. uh, since I don't know them all personally, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't answer that. In some ways, the ego serves us to continue to strive forward. But in my research of Aristotle, mostly, uh, I did not see anywhere that he was listed as a egotistic. He was very humble. As a matter of fact, the way he taught, he let anybody available to, for his teachings. He didn't charge for his teachings. His requirement was, though, you had to excel in science. That was science and math were the two requirements. But he was open to anyone, and he didn't teach in the classroom. He taught outside. He would walk around, and his disciples would follow him, and it was available for anyone. So I don't see that as ego. And he was the greatest polymath there. Throughout the list, I don't think ego is tied to it. I think if you're expressing these different things, I don't believe ego would be a part of it. But that's just my perception. So again, I, I think anything that your students can become egotistic. It could become, yeah. But I, you know, I think if I think about Plato, I don't think he was egotistical. Socrates ended up taking the hemlock, even though the government granted him ex the, the permission not to. He did it anyway because he said you have to follow law, and that's not ego. So. I don't think it was, I don't feel ego was part of problem All right, excellent. Well, thank Leonardo you, everyone. Leonardo. We'll see you. Thank Sorry. you. Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci? Mm -hmm. I don't know too much about him. I just know the name. So I don't know if he was egotistical or not. Is no. da Vinci the one who cut I his ear? I don't think. No, 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 he's a great engineer. He was what? He was a great engineer. A great probably en 10 generations of head of probably ahead of us today. Do you think he was egotistical though? No. No, I don't think I don't think anyone on the list is egotistical. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Well bye. Go. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>